prime time local news, serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. Good evening and welcome to prime time local news. Four more Saskatchewan residents who tested positive for COVID-19 have died. There are 382 new cases to report, including 45 in the Northwest Zone. 4,010 cases are considered active, with 479 of them in our zone. 210 people are in hospital, including 11 in our zone. 35 of those are in intensive care, with two of them in the Northwest. There are 231 new recoveries, and just over 14,000 people have been vaccinated. A Lloydminster resident is speaking out after the search for Elizabeth Davidson earlier this month, asking the city to use it as a learning experience. Eric Bay has more. It's more about, uh, it's more about what can we do in the future to capitalize on our resources. One of dozens of Lloydminster residents to take to the streets after Elizabeth Davidson went missing. Daryl Dunn is hoping everyone involved in the search uses the experience to plan for the future. While people were updating the search through social media such as Facebook, Dunn says no one was taking charge of the operation. The numbers of people uh, were significant that came out and got involved in the search through, through nothing other than wanting to help out. Uh, the sad reality was that there was nobody to kind of coordinate that effort. After several searches throughout the city, Davidson was found deceased. In an open letter to City Council, Dunn, a former police officer, wants to see a strategy put in place for future searches. This is not about pointing blame at anybody. Uh, this is going to happen again, whether we like it or not. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Um, and if it happens again, clearly the spirit is there within the city to get out and help out. City Council has reviewed the letter and the city is looking at what they can take away from the search. We want to make sure that uh, we, we learn from every event. Uh, I can say that every available resource was applied through the process. The RCMP led that investigation and led the search, working with others, uh, deployed a lot of resources. Once you have a situation like this, always take a look at, at what went on, what happened, how it happened, who was involved, and see how we can make it better the next time. Eric Bay, Primetime Local News. The Vermilion Elementary School Hot Lunch Program is looking for individuals to sponsor meals. Jace Mackey has more with President, Program President Brandon Tupper. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the Vermilion Elementary School Lunch Program. Uh, thanks for taking some time to talk with me today, Brandon. Yeah, my pleasure. Happy New Year. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted you to just talk a little bit about what the Hot Lunch Program is. Sure. So it's been just over 20 years now since this program has been in Vermilion. Uh, it's specific and local to the Vermilion Elementary School here. Um, it was brought as a need for the community or for the school, I guess, when teachers started noticing kids coming with inadequate or no lunch at all, and they saw the impact that uh, that was having on kids learning. So we're, we're rooted pretty deep in the community. This program has been around for a long time. Um, I guess like our guiding foundation document would be um, ensure that each kid gets a hot nutritious meal regardless of their ability to pay make it convenient option for parents and yeah that's kind of the the direction that it has been for the last 20 years and we continue to move forward in through uh 2020s here and now the program is looking for uh gift card donations can you just tell me a little bit more about that sure so I, like I had mentioned earlier, we ensure that uh, every kid, regardless of parents' ability to pay, will receive a meal. Um, we'd run fundraisers in the past that are more community-based. So we would do like an, uh, an annual pancake breakfast where we would raise money, or we do community dances and we have silent auctions and we're able to reach our community a lot better when we were able to meet in person. Um, or it's like volunteer intensive fundraising and we're unable to do that. So COVID kind of forced us into the tech side, make our brand a little more digital, making sure we have all our efficiencies in place. And we started coming up with ideas. Uh, Vermilion is an extremely generous community. They want to help out. They've always helped out. And it's just a matter of finding a way to connect with, uh, put the two parties together. So 
we come up with this idea that you could sponsor meals for kids at school. It's a little more intimate, a little more, um, you know, you can see that check is, is going to actually help, uh, you know, students who would not normally have a hot nutritious meal. So a little more, um, we could call it the supporting local, maybe not just on the business side, but just helping one another out in our community here. And for people who are interested in uh, sponsoring a meal, how would they go about doing so? So all the details are on our Facebook page, Vermilion Elementary uh, Hot Lunch Program Facebook page here in Vermilion, and we can set you up with uh, how to do that. Uh, that'd probably be the best way to do it. And uh, you touched on this a little earlier on, but just how important is it to be able to have uh, this hot lunch program at the Vermilion Elementary School and also be able to give it to everyone uh, without, you know, not forcing everyone to pay. And if they're not able to pay, they're still able to get the, the lunch. So even more important, it was this fall when we were unsure of all the COVID restrictions because we had the, the school reopening to abide by. And then we also had the restaurants, pubs, and that guideline. We were unsure how to, to meet all that guidelines and deliver a program at the school. Uh, so we had a pretty slow rollout trying to figure it out. And it became evident that uh, you, you can see the the concern parents had. I mean, lots of people had lots of energy to be able to bring a hot lunch to school, but over time here and into November, like the quality of nutrition dropped off and uh, kids stopped coming to school essentially without meals. And it's like, okay, we have to do something. Um, I can't see Vermilion is no different than any other school around. So those listening, your school, your hot lunch programs, your breakfast programs, they, they could definitely use a hand here financially that the cost to deliver a higher nutritious meal is it, it does cost more and then in order to meet all the COVID requirements it's it's been a challenge not only just financially but just more practically and being able to figure that out especially if you don't have a, a strong online digital tech side mm -hmm. of, of reaching your audience I guess. Something else I was going to ask too, and you obviously brought it up too, is just how, what kind of stuff did you guys have to adjust when it came to uh, following COVID restrictions? So it was the total number of all, I say the number one was the total number of volunteers that it took to run our program in past years. Um, and it was a good way for our community to, to connect with our school. Um, that came to a grinding halt, not being able to go into the school to prepare the meals. So having to prepare offsite and bring that meal to the school, essentially like a DoorDash version of hot lunch versus students coming to us at the school and we, we plate the meal. So that was our biggest adjustment was, uh, yeah, being able to get that hot nutritious food from offsite to the classroom with minimal impact to the school. And the teachers and staff are doing an amazing job at keeping our students safe right now. And the last thing we wanted to do was create uh, more of a headache. We, we needed to come in and be convenient, not only to, to parents, but also we needed to stay convenient to the school and not impact their current operations. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk to me today. And for people at home that are interested in uh, contributing and sponsoring a Vermilion lunch program, they can go on the Facebook page and they're able to uh, find more info there. Now we're Connor Chan. We'll take a look at your weather forecast. All right, thanks a lot, Jasmine. Looking at temperatures right now, minus four is what we are seeing right now. We did see a little bit of sun throughout the day today, but mostly some cloud coverage, of course. With that wind chill, it did feel a little bit more like minus 10. We are expecting some warmer temperatures heading into the weekend here. Let's take a look at some other temperatures in the area. Minus three in St. Paul, Vermilion as well. We see minus fours up in Marwayne, Bonneville, and Cold Lake as well. Three degrees out in Edmonton with minus one in Vagraville. One degree in Lac La Biche right now. Taking a look here into uh, Saskatchewan temperatures, minus eight in North Battleford along with Meadow Lake at minus 10 right now, minus 6 in Maidstone and St. Wahlberg as well, and minus 7 we see there up in Green Lake. Now as we take a look here at the satellite radar map, we did have a little bit of activity there. There was some snow activity in those uh, northern Saskatchewan areas for today, but nothing compared to what we saw earlier in the week here, but it should be pretty clear for the most part. We could see some stuff heading into Sunday in terms of some flurry activity 
for us here in the immediate area. But looking at North Battleford overnight, it's going to clear up overnight tonight at minus 11 as we go into tomorrow. Very nice temperatures there for a daytime high there of minus 2 degrees with mostly some sun and a little bit of cloud coverage throughout the day. Minus 8 overnight in Cold Lake. Going into tomorrow at 0 degrees for the day with the wind chill kind of picking up a little bit more at the 22 kilometers an hour. So it could feel a little bit more like around that minus 4 to minus 6 range there with some sunny skies there. And then for us here in Lloydminster, we could see a daytime high of uh, overnight, excuse me, at minus 8 tonight going into tomorrow. Minus 2 is the expected daytime high with some sun and a few clouds throughout the day. Now here's a look at what we could see heading into the next couple of days. I did mention the fact that there could be some snow coming in once again on Sunday that carries over into Monday as well. That wind chill could feel a little bit more like minus 13 on both Saturday and on Sunday there. Minus 4 is the expected daytime high for Sunday. That 74% chance of some snow there. Minus 10 the low there and then minus 3 on Monday with that daytime low there of minus 9. That is a first look at your weather forecast. We'll have more primetime local news after this. Welcome back. If you're a pet owner, you may be happy to learn you'll be saving a few extra dollars from now on. Our Becca Day looks at how the elimination of pet licenses could affect you. I'm here with Glenn Alfred, Senior Manager of Public Safety, to discuss the newly updated domestic animal bylaw. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Uh, so what led to the decision to eliminate pet licenses? Well, pet licensing has uh, been an issue for us for some time. Um, there's probably only about four or five percent of animal owners, dogs and cats, um, only about uh, four or five percent actually go out and get a, a license. So the uptake was very low. Um, most people don't realize that uh, the city in an agreement with the SPCA locally did, uh, did not actually receive any of the money that all went to the SPCA. But um, we did have um, some discussions with people in Spruce Grove. They have a bylaw there where they were using this pet identification tag, which is supplied by the owner. So they don't actually have to get a license every year. They just buy this tag once a year, or pardon me, buy the tag once for their animal. It has an operational telephone number on it. And if the animal is a stray and is picked up by any of our staff, Instead of going into the SPCA uh, because the animal's not identified, we can then uh, just call the owner and find out where they're at. You know, in a lot of cases, they're out looking for the animal already, and um, and we can get the animal back to them without having to go into the pound. Less stress on the animal, less stress on the owner uh, trying to find their animal as well, and they're reunited a lot quicker. So uh, that's why we went with that, and council was very supportive of the idea. Absolutely. And you mentioned now getting a tag. Do some owners already have the tag or is this a specific one to this new implementation that they have to now go out and get? Uh, any tag that, that um, is uh, permanent and, and can be affixed to a collar uh, is going to work just fine. And as long as uh, the phone number is still operational, we can get a hold of people. Just out of curiosity, how much was the pet license fee to, um, when it existed? Well, it varied. Um, it uh, was as high as $60 in some cases, and uh, it depended whether or not the animal had been spayed or neutered. But uh, again, this just streamlines things for pet owners in the city of Lloydminster. And so now they're paying uh, a fee to, to, to buy their, their pet tag. So it's probably eight to $10 to have it engraved with your telephone number. And it's good for the life of that animal, uh, as long as you have the same telephone number. So um, it, it reduces the cost of pet ownership as well. So if you're looking at, you know, between a $30 to $60 uh, cost per year over 10 years uh, for licensing, you know, anywhere from $300 to $600 that you're going to save on your pet. And do you have anything you'd like to add on the topic regarding the bylaw? The bylaw had a couple other changes in it as well. Um, before, uh, before the new bylaw was passed uh, on the 11th by council, it uh, didn't differentiate between issues between dogs or a, a dog attack on another dog and a dog attack on a person. It was the same fine and we've separated that out so that, um, you know, that it's much more serious when a, an animal attacks a person. 
So uh, the fines were changed with respect to that. So the, the dog on dog attack stayed the same and dog on person attack went up just to reflect the seriousness of the, uh, the offense, so. Great. Well, thank you so much, Glenn. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. In the world of sports, our Evan Kenny had the chance to catch up with a former Lloyd local who happens to be a Para Pan Am game silver medalist in wheelchair rugby. Well, I'm pleased to be joined today by a Lloyd Minster local who's taken his skills to the national stage, Brandon Troutman, uh, a member of the Team Canada wheelchair rugby team. Brandon, thank you for joining me. I guess just over this chaotic 2020 uh, and into 2021 year, just what have you been up to to, to keep mastering your craft? So for the first couple of months, it was rough, you know, um, in, inside training in your apartment training. That was a uh, that was a long few months for sure, but uh, in the summer, kind of, I moved to Vancouver, and um, yeah, things went back to normal pretty fast here, or pretty close to normal anyways, and uh, we started training full-time at the Oval again, Richmond Olympic Oval is just a great facility for us, so we train there lots, just about every day of the week, and uh, it's been it's been weird, but uh, I'm sure everybody has to deal with the same things, so no need to complain. <laughs> now, Brandon, you had already played wheelchair basketball. Now, how did you get into wheelchair rugby? Yeah, yeah. I was playing wheelchair basketball at the time and uh, putting lots of time in. And uh, a friend, uh, Zach, Zach Medell, uh showed me the sport. And uh, I just instantly fell in love with it. It was uh, just a lot of what I was looking for in a sport. The teammates are amazing. The people in the community are, like, I don't, I've, I've never found a better community. So, yeah, it's just really easy to transition from basketball to rugby. And rugby is a full contact sport. And, I, you know, I like being a little rough sometimes. So, <laughs> Now, was it the hits, maybe the scoring, the defense? What was it that was your favorite part and that really drew you in? Yeah, no, um, I still got to stay with my teammates, man. It's just uh, the best part of the sport. And, uh uh, thing I'm looking forward to is obviously the Paralympics. Sadly, they got postponed, but uh, I am more than ready to compete at, uh, at Tokyo, and hopefully I make the team when the time comes. Now, Brandon, for uh, kids out there, you know, a lot of people dream about representing their country, especially on an athletic side of things. Just two years after you joined the sport of wheelchair rugby, you got that chance to represent uh, Team Canada and Canada across the world. Just what was that experience like for you? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a huge honor for sure. I uh, take take it with pride every day. I that that's what pushed me to go to the gym every day, work my hardest, um, bust my ass, and uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just a huge honor to go across countries, travel the world, and play for Team Canada. And everybody loves Canada when when I travel anywhere. We're the greatest guests to have around, I guess. So. <laughs> Now, you're currently the youngest player on Team Canada. Uh, do you have a biggest achievement so far? Um, no, not yet. I got my eyes on one in the future right now. So that's, that's all I'm really worried about. I got, a, I got a few medals in basketball too, but nothing compares to, you know, that Tokyo, that Tokyo gold medal. So I really plan to aim for that. And I've been working hard to do so. And my teammates have been doing the same. And I feel like we're ready to uh, prove that we made this sport and we're ready for it. Well, Brandon, thank you very much for taking this time and joining me. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much for having me. This was Brandon Troutman, a member of the Team Canada wheelchair rugby team. All right, thanks very much there, Jasmine. Looking right now, still sitting around that minus four mark as we see that here in Lloydminster as well as up in Cold Lake as we look ahead west. Much warmer temperatures there as we see lots of temperatures in the plus region there. Plus threes in Edmonton, Athabasca, and Jasper, while seven degrees there we see in Edson and in Rocky Mountain House. A little bit different in Saskatchewan as we see minuses on the opposite spectrum there. Minus 10 for Meadow Lake, Prince Albert, and Melford right now, while minus eight sits for both North Battleford and in Saskatoon as well as we look ahead up north 
to northern Saskatchewan right now. Minus 5 for the Lalash Buffalo and Arrows as well with minus 7 in LaRange with minus 15 down for Flin Flon there. Minus 11 in South End and well as in Stony Rapids. Minus 4 as we look, actually excuse me, plus 4 degrees excuse me in Fort McMurray with minus 2 in Fort Chippewa as well as minus 5 for high level. Then we see plus 5s in Peace River, Grand Prairie and then plus 7 in Slave Lake as well. Looking ahead to southern Alberta, a little bit warm as well. 6 degrees for Medicine Hat while 7 degrees sits in Lethbridge right now and 8 degrees in Calgary right now. Zero up in Coronation there and then we see 1 degree there down in Banff and looking ahead to southern Saskatchewan. We look ahead at minus 6 in Moose Jaw and minus 8 in Regina, minus 9 for Yorkton and then minus 3 we see there in Swift Current and minus 7 in Kindersley and in Estevan as well. So very different temperatures we see on both of those uh, spectres there in both provinces there. So as we look ahead into the national temperatures now, a bit of fog though in Regina as they sit at that minus 8 mark there, minus 9 for Winnipeg right now as of course we do see some rain in Toronto at plus 5 degrees. Degrees, minus one in Quebec City, minus two in St. John's, minus one for Halifax. Clear skies for Edmonton throughout the day today at that plus three mark there. 11 in Vancouver right now, a little bit of snow up in Yellowknife. And then as we see in Whitehorse, minus one with that snow continuing on as well. As we look ahead into tomorrow, we are expecting some a little bit of cloud coverage throughout the day. A nice sun and cloud mix at that temperature of minus two. And it could feel a little bit colder than that at minus 13 with the added wind chill. If you consider that factor there, minus two though for Marwayne tomorrow as well as in Vegerville. Minus Minus one in St. Paul, Bonneville, zero degrees up in Cold Lake and Pierceland as well. Minus two in Maidstone and North Battleford for tomorrow. Minus one we see up across the northern areas here in St. Wahlberg, Meadow Lake and Green Lake as well. Macklin at minus one tomorrow as well. And then we see Isla Cross way up north there sitting at minus three. And then we'll see zeros tomorrow in those areas in Wainwright and in Provost as well. Now taking a look here at the next seven days, we are seeing a possibility of some more snow coming back here into the mix here. Minus four on Sunday with a chance of some snow there and then carrying it over into Monday as well. That's more that as a very likely possibility. Minus three heading into Monday with mostly cloud coverage there with a low there of minus nine with a possibility of some more icy conditions possibly on the way there on Tuesday and then snow continuing again there as we see through most the majority of the week on Wednesday at minus six, minus 12 Thursday there and minus 13 on Friday. That is a look at your weather for now. We'll have more primetime local news coming up after the break. Welcome back. A group of Albertans with disabilities are coming together to express their concern with wait times for health care support. Tate Laycraft has the story. So my guest this afternoon is the community lead for a new Alberta advocacy group that aims to give a voice to people with disabilities. Bean Gill, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So what can you tell me about Wheels of Change? What inspired the foundation of this group? So our group, we're just a bunch of friends actually. We all have spinal cord injuries and we've been friends for a few years and we've just seen like, you know, we were kind of complaining about all the things that people complain about. And when you have a disability, there's a lot more other things to complain about, such as policies and procedures and, you know, equipment and all of things. And as we were talking, we just kind of realized that this is something that does need to change and that can change. And I mean, who better to do it than us people who have lived experience and who um, can really value from the change that's coming and also to help the people that are coming behind us because spinal cord injuries happen every day, unfortunately. And so all the struggles and stuff that we went through, we want to try to change it so that other people don't have to go through those as well. So talking about change, what kind of goals does the group have? What does Wheels of Change seek to accomplish? Uh, well, we have big lofty goals. <laughs> Um, but right now, we're really hoping to change the policies and procedures with AADL. So that's um, Alberta Aids to Daily Living, which is a very vital program that provides equipment and um, supplies to Albertans living with disabilities all across the province. Um, there's no disagreeing with that. The disagreement comes with the process and way things happen. There's way too much paperwork, there's so much red tape, and there's long, long wait times, which have detrimental effects to people who are waiting for that equipment, myself included. In regard to those effects, how does a delay like that impact someone such as yourself? So speaking of just of my experience, um, so 
Uh, you, you need to have a cushion for your wheelchair, right? The cushion is very important because you have to be sitting properly. There can't be too much pressure on your sit bones because you can get pressure sores. The way you sit really affects the rest of your body and humans aren't designed to sit, right? We're designed to be bipedal. But when you do have to sit, you have to make sure you're sitting properly. And so for myself, I'm sitting on a Rojo cushion, which is air under my butt. When that pops, you can fix it a few times, but then there's, it comes a time where it just can't be fixed anymore. And then you have to buy a new cushion. This is a thousand dollars for the cushion that I'm sitting on. And so I went through AADL. This was an emergency. My cushion had popped. I needed one ASAP. These companies also, the vendors, they don't rent out cushions for obvious reasons. And so there's no really like replacement of that. So when I ordered my emergency cushion, when I went to go get assessed, and it was the exact same cushion that I had previously. So all they had to do is just reorder the same one, same size, everything. She had to fill up 23 pieces of paper. I counted them because she put, put them all out on the bed. I counted them. I'm like, this is a little ridiculous. And she said, she's like, I know they keep changing all the policies and we keep having to add more paperwork to everything. And not only was it 23 sheets of paper, it was five to seven months I had to wait for my cushion, right? Like that's inexcusable. And luckily I was able to borrow a cushion from a friend, but had I not, I would have ended up with a pressure sore. I already have scoliosis. So that would, would have gotten worse. And if you're not sitting properly, there's so many other things that happen to you, um, like secondary complications from your shoulders, from your lungs, so many things can change. And so that's what we want to change is why does it have to take that long? Why does it have to take five months for somebody to order an emergency cushion or an emergency piece of equipment? It shouldn't. For people who are interested in Wheels of Change and maybe want to show their support or learn more, or well, where can they go? What can they do? Yeah, so you can go to our website, which is www.wheelsofchange.ca. Um, we also have our Instagram, which is at wheelsofchangeca. Um, on our website, you can see all of our bios um, and then you can contact us through there or through our Instagram and we're all just regular people and so we're more than willing to help or more than willing to talk to people and um, if anybody out there needs support or is looking for something to help them through their issues, definitely come and reach out to us. We're more than happy to help. Thanks so much for joining me today, Bean. No problem. Thank you for having me. Now we will be taking a look at your pet pad pictures. Thank you to everyone who submitted your pictures to our Facebook page. And we will be giving away a pet pad gift card at the end of the next hour. We want to see your pets. Send photos of your pet and their name to our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to have them featured on Pet of the Day. Your name will be entered into a weekly draw for a gift certificate from the Pet Pad. I'm joined today on Primetime Local News by Nicole White, and Nicole is with a group called Moontime Sisters. Uh, Nicole, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Nicole, I want you to start out by explaining a little bit about what Moontime Sisters is. Sure. So we actually started in January 2017 after I heard a story about young women in northern Saskatchewan who couldn't go to school because they couldn't afford menstrual products and, and that's something we can we can find a, a solution around which is how we organize to um to get the word out and get products to others has it been a, a successful project even more successful than you thought it would be it really has. So since we started in 2017, we have opened up a chapter in Ontario. And between the two chapters, we've been able to get over a million products to northern communities in Canada. 
And how do you collect these products, Nicole? Are there uh, certain donation points or drop-off points, or how do people get the products uh, to you to get them distributed? It's really a, a full spectrum. So people can donate. We've got fixed locations in two places in, in Saskatoon and Regina. And then a lot of people donate online. If you go to moontimesisters.ca, uh, you can also check us out on Facebook and get plugged in that way. So when it comes to organizing something like this, Nicole, and now, of course, because of the situation with COVID, has that been a bit of a struggle for you to try and get this to where it needs to be? Or have you just had to find ways to work around it? It really, yeah, we were in the middle of our drive last springtime, uh, like our provincial drive when COVID hit. So we had to cancel everything and just sort of put everything on hold for a bit. And then slowly but surely, people started connecting with us and asking for products. So we've been getting a uh, product up individually. The problem is, is that I'm actually doing all of the packing and counting this way. Usually we have huge community work fees where we share the load and count and gather everything together for our northern communities. And that hasn't been able to happen because of the pandemic. Now, back in 2019, Nicole, you were honored as one of the uh, people who won the L'Oreal Paris um, Woman of the Worth Award. Um, tell me about that. How did you get nominated and what was it like to actually be announced as one of the winners? Oh, my gosh. It was honestly one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Uh, our 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 chapter organizer in Ontario or nominated me and uh, we got this call up and out of the blue and they flew my family to Toronto and we had the most amazing night. There were celebrities and Lainey Lou from the talk introduced me and there was a red carpet we walked. It was it was really magical. <laughs> and what what has uh, come of that award since then? Has it helped, uh, you know, maybe promote your cause a little bit more too because of, of the award? Absolutely. So it's given us national recognition. We've been able to get articles in Chatelaine magazine. We had people talking about us on national newscasts, and we've really helped to amplify the issue of menstrual equality. So yeah, it was a huge opportunity, and I'm profoundly thankful to L'Oreal for giving us that, that, that great opportunity. Now, going through into 2021, I know a lot of us hope things would be better already, but we're hopefully slowly getting there. Uh, how can people get involved now, Nicole, if they would like to donate, whether it be products or cash or the best way to do it or, or look into, you know, maybe setting up a, a place in their community where they can make some uh, bins? What is the best way to get that information? Absolutely. So I would connect with us on our Facebook group. So just search out Moontime Sisters. We've got a blue logo and you'll find me readily on the page so you can connect with me directly there. If you're interested in starting a branch within your own province, we will help support that development. And if you want to donate online, just, just check out moontimesisters.ca for further information. Well, Nicole, thank you so much for joining us today. This is just such a great project, and I know it's a need for a lot of women uh, everywhere, but particularly, as you said, in the Northern community. So congratulations on winning the award in 2019 and just for doing this project in general. Like I said, just amazing. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to chat. Well, joining us is Abby St. John for the entertainment panel. Abby, out on Disney Plus now is the very highly weighted, long awaited rather, WandaVision, which you've already had the chance to watch a few of the episodes that are out now. Lots of mixed reviews from critics, but I'm personally curious to know what you thought of that series. It's different for, you know, Marvel since it's their very first TV series with big major MCU characters. So just what's your thoughts so far on WandaVision? Well, the first two episodes have been dropped on Disney Plus, um, and so I decided to watch them before uh, doing this panel, and I really enjoyed it. It was very, very different from any Marvel movie that you've seen, so keep that in mind when you watch it. I think that's the biggest thing. It is not the same. They take a 50 style sitcom, black and white at the beginning, and um, you really see that they go for the that classic traditional uh, 50 style, 60 style sitcom. So you have to keep that in mind when you watch it. Um, not a ton of 
things have happened so far. It's just Wanda and Vision getting settled in their new suburb um, and trying to act like normal human beings, even though we all know that they're not. Um, so, so far it's been very good. Uh, it has a lot of comedy elements to it, which I uh, really liked. And again, it's so unique and such a different concept, such a different take on a superhero storyline that I think everyone who's a fan of Marvel should really enjoy. Yeah, interesting to see how it plays into down the road. I know more episodes are expected to be released later on. And now, of course, they did say it is going to connect towards, you know, Doctor Strange 2 and even Spider-Man 3, which come out later this year, as well as heading into next year with Doctor Strange 2. Um, speaking of Spider-Man, Tom Holland, of course, has taken a much more dramatic turn. We did see that in his latest Netflix movie, but now he's teaming up with the Russo brothers again, which they're calling this performance in the movie Cherry, which the trailer dropped uh, not too long ago about a man suffering from PTSD, a war veteran coming back and who of course turns to a life of crime and drugs there. It's obviously a much different take for Holland who we're so used to seeing as that quirky Peter uh, Peter Parker. So Abby, just what do you take, uh, what do you take from away, take away, excuse me, from that trailer of Tom Holland there? Yeah, the trailer was fantastic. It's really gearing, it really shows that this is going to be a fantastic movie. And of course, um, the Russo brothers, everyone knows that they're fantastic um, just by Marvel itself. But that, like you said, this is a very, very different movie than Marvel. It is based on a novel uh, by Nico Walker called Cherry, and which is loosely based on his life. And like you said, it's a young man who Tom Holland plays um, enlisting in the army and then going down a life of very big struggles. He has undiagnosed PTSD, which turns into him becoming a drug addict. Um, and then f his relationship with the love of his life, Emily, falls apart. Then he starts robbing banks so that he could he can feed his addiction. Um, the Russo brothers, they think they said that this is a perfect movie to put out there you know, because it's so close, it hits so close to home with the opioid crisis that is currently happening all across the world, but especially down in the United States. And it also touches on PTSD with soldiers returning home from war. Um, so it really dives into the mental um, health issues that come along with PTSD and opioid addictions. And the Russo brothers have said, You'll get a taste of Holland's incredible performance in this movie and the range that he displays as an actor. Um, Joe Russo says, I think you're seeing him transform from a teen actor into an adult actor, which I agree just by watching the trailer. I think he does in the trailer, it shows that he does a fantastic job portraying um, the struggles that his character um, goes through throughout the movie. Um, so I'm very excited to see um, how it goes and what the rest of the movie that we didn't see in the trailer goes. Um, and it will be in theaters starting on February 26th before streaming on Apple TV on March 12th. It's going to be very interesting to see, of course. We all know Tom Holland, of course, as that quirky Peter Parker, as I said. But it's good to see him take on these much more adult roles, like you said. Abby St. John, thank you very much. Thank you. A delicious steak would sure hit the spot with this cold weather. And while maybe you're not able to fire up your barbecue, the Lloydminster Kinsmen and Kinettes, they're going to do it for you with their Telemiracle Steak Night. Steak Night is going to be a bit of a different format this year. It's coming up on Saturday, February the 6th. And when you order your Steak Night Supper, they're going to deliver it right to your door. Plus, they're offering kids meals this year as well for 10 bucks. Telemiracle Steak Night, still raising money for for Telemiracle, supporting a great cause, and you get to enjoy a great meal. Plus, they'll be live streaming some entertainment as well. If you want to get your ticket, just get in touch with any member of the Lloydminster Kinsman and Kinettes. Get your tickets now for Telemiracle Steak Night on February 6th. You still got an opportunity to take part in the Lloydminster Kinnett's Glow Run. This run is one that you can do anytime between now and Sunday. It's five kilometers. You run, you walk whenever it fits into your schedule. So if you want to head outdoors and take on the snow run, you can do that. If you want to do it on your treadmill, you're welcome to do that as well. There's still time for you to get registered and take part. Funds raised will go to Cystic Fibrosis Canada and the Kinnett Club of Lloydminster. 
And the town of Vermilion is hosting their fifth annual mental health and wellness conference. It's coming up on Wednesday and this year it is a virtual format with a number of different guest speakers and it is a free event. However, you do need to get registered so that they can send the links your way. Just get registered online for this Wednesday's event. Well, whatever you choose to do this weekend, we hope you stay safe and stay healthy. All right, taking one last look here at your weather forecast, minus two heading into tomorrow. We are going to see some nice warmer temperatures what we saw over a little bit there as we look into Sunday. The possibility of more snow is possible as we look at that 74% chance there at minus four for the daytime high. It could carry over into Monday as well with that high of minus three. Some clear and mixed and sun and cloud uh, temperatures expected for Tuesday, but could create some more icy conditions and possibly some showers maybe there with that 57% chance there on the screen. Minus six on Wednesday and then minus 12 there on Thursday, so doubles that heading into the Thursday there and the possibility of again more scattered flurries throughout the day there on both those days. And as we look ahead into Friday, minus 13, the expected daytime high with a sun and cloud mix throughout the day and a low there of minus 18 is our usual averages minus 10 for our average daytime high and averaging minus 19 for our, our average daytime low. Thank you for joining us on Primetime Local News. Have a great night. Thank you.